there's something here. That's not meant to be. This demon was once an angel. Rejected by God. You send that thing back to hell. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we'll be exploring The Nun 2, the recently released supernatural horror film directed by Michael Chavez. Functioning as a sequel to 2018's The Nun, and essentially the eighth entry to the Conjuring universe created by James Wan, the film stars Thaisa Famiga, Jonas Bloquet, Bonnie Ahrens, Anna Popplewell, Storm Reid, and Caitlin Rose Downey. In the enticing sequel to the gothic tale of unimaginable horrors, we're whisked away to a quaint French town in 1956, which is plagued not by the latest fashion trends, but a sinister evil. When reports buzz about a priest and other holy people meeting an untimely and rather gruesome end, enter Sister Irene, who dives headfirst into this ecclesiastical whodunit. As the pieces start falling into place, who should be the culprit but the malevolent force known as Valak that had already tormented her in the past? With the demon threatening to destroy her friends and the lives of many that depended on the church, Irene must effectively confront her past with the help of her comrades to defeat one of the most insidious forms of evil out there. In this video, we're going to run through the entire Nun timeline with a breakdown of the first film and its characters before turning our attention to the sequel. James Wan, the mastermind behind several of the biggest horror franchises, including Saw, Insidious, and of course The Conjuring, has woven an intricate tapestry of interlinked tales, with The Nun holding a unique position in this narrative web. Rooted deeply within the shadowy branches of Wan's sprawling Conjuring universe, Corin Hardy's 2018 offering is a prequel, and a historical dive into the backstory of one of the most chilling characters from The Conjuring 2, the demonic nun known as Valak. The film ominously opens in 1952, at the Carter Monastery in Romania. Two nuns traverse a shadowy corridor, leading them to a doorway with an eerie warning that God ends here. As the older one bravely enters to retrieve an artifact, the younger one, named Sister Victoria, is left outside praying fervently. Unfortunately, the former returns, mortally wounded, and urges Sister Victoria to flee. With Valak slowly advancing towards her, a terrified Sister Victoria, holding onto a key, sacrifices her life. Stumbling upon the body while delivering supplies to the nuns, a local villager nicknamed Frenchie is horrified by the sight and places her body on ice inside a nearby building. It's not long before news of Sister Victoria's suicide, an act considered a grievous sin, reaches the Vatican. And so, to investigate this mysterious death and determine the sanctity of the site, the Vatican assigns Father Burke, a priest with a history of handling sensitive matters, and pairs him with Sister Irene, a young novitiate who hasn't taken her final vows yet. Irene has essentially been selected because she's had visions related to the events, even though she doesn't understand them fully. You were recommended for the journey because of your familiarity with the territory. Every decision the Vatican makes is with purpose. I'm sure they had their reasons for selecting you. Traveling to Romania, Father Burke and Sister Irene meet Frenchie and then head to the monastery. But when the man leads them to where he kept Sister Victoria's body, they realize that the body had inexplicably moved. The mystery deepens further as Father Burke discovers the key that we saw clenched in Sister Victoria's hand. Father, what is it? it seems to be a key of some kind. From the get-go, the priest is portrayed as a seasoned, albeit haunted priest due to a past exorcism gone wrong. He's methodical and takes his duty seriously. Sister Irene, on the other hand, is spirited and curious, with their visions playing a critical role in the narrative, and there's a clear mentor-mentee dynamic developing between them. Frenchie provides some comic relief, but he's also pivotal to the plot. His interactions with Irene and Father Burke are tinged with mild flirtations and skepticism about the supernatural, respectively. The monastery, with its gothic architecture and fog-shrouded backdrop, becomes a character in itself, adding to the overall tension. And as Father Burke's sister Irene and Frenchie approach the abbey, the nuns inside, particularly the abbess, are not entirely welcoming. The Mother Superior informs them that the nuns are currently engaging in a vow of silence for Sister Victoria. As a result, the group cannot enter the abbey until the next day. Come back tomorrow and you will find the answers you seek. Despite the urgency of their mission, 
Left without a choice in the matter, the delay forces him to spend the night at the nearby convent. But as night falls, each character encounters their own share of supernatural experiences. Frenchie, departing from the duo, passes by a darkened forest and is startled by an apparition resembling the deceased sister Victoria. <laughs> He's subsequently attacked by a demon nun, but is resourceful enough to pick up a nearby cross and protect himself. Meanwhile, Sister Irene confides in Father Burke about her childhood visions. She's basically been haunted by a repeated phrase, Mary points the way, a recurring motif in the film. I had a series of visions when I was a girl. My father believed I was mentally unstable, but word of my visions reached the church. After each one ended, the same thought would be stuck in my head. Which was? Mary points the way. Father Burke, in turn, shares a painful memory from his past. An exorcism he performed on a young boy named Daniel in France that ended tragically, with the boy succumbing to his injuries, leaving Father Burke with profound guilt. Help me, Father! Behold the cross of the Lord! The hostile force! As the eerie sound of music fills the air, Father Burke is lured into the woods, where he confronts a ghostly, malevolent version of Daniel that traps Burke inside a coffin, burying him alive and leaving him with a solitary bell. Irene's night is no less terrifying. As she wanders around the chapel, she comes face to face with the sinister Valak. The demon makes a violent attempt to harm Irene, but she's saved by the timely ringing of bells, a signal from the buried Father Burke. With multiple grave bells ringing simultaneously, Irene frantically searches for and eventually finds Father Burke's grave, rescuing him in the nick of time. In the aftermath of the harrowing night, the duo end up discovering a series of occult books inside the coffin with Father Burke, a hint at the evil that pervades the monastery. There is a powerful evil presence in this place. Maybe those books will help shine a light on our answer. The following day, they're finally granted entry into the abbey. While Father Burke is denied further access, Irene meets up with another nun, Sister Oana, through which Irene learns about the evil history of the abbey. We discovered that a duke once tried to summon the demonic Valak, and though he was stopped, the entity remained trapped in the abbey, lurking and waiting for another chance to wreak havoc. Valak, the defiler, the profane. Hell used him to open a gateway so that an unspeakable evil would walk amongst us. Valak's opportunity ultimately came during World War II bombings, which inadvertently unsealed the demon, who horrifically took on the appearance of a nun. Father Burke's past trauma also soon becomes more pronounced, revealing a layer of vulnerability beneath his composed exterior. And though Sister Irene's faith in her visions are tested, she exhibits bravery and determination. God save you. As Burke continues his research, the dangerous history of Valak becomes more evident. First appearing in The Conjuring 2 as a demon responsible for haunting the Hodgson family, we soon came to find out that Valak the Defiler had garnered a particular hatred for Lorraine Warren. Mom, who's that? The demon in your painting is real. Though it usually took the form of a nun, the demon was also responsible for the Crooked Man, the presumed antagonist of The Conjuring 2, until the film's conclusion. Much of what we know about Valak can be attributed to the Lesser Key of Solomon, a 17th century text that identifies the key players of Hell. For those of you who remember my video on Hereditary, it's basically where we get all the information about the Demon King payment, along with his disturbing cult. In the Lesser Key of Solomon, Valak is referred to as the Great President of Hell, and throughout the ages, the demon is often been pictured riding a two-headed dragon whilst commanding 30 legions of demons. Although the entity was believed to be one of the most powerful servants of Satan, I thought it was interesting that it was always quite keen to share strength and knowledge to devoted magical practitioners. This, I presume, is what inspired the Duke to open a doorway to Hell in the first place, as Valak had likely offered him knowledge and power beyond his natural scope. It should also be noted that in the prequel, Annabelle Creation, set between the 1940s and mid-60s, Sister Charlotte shows Mr. Mullins a picture of herself in Romania with three other nuns. Sister Maria, that's Sister Anna, and that's Sister Lucia. 
Who's this? I don't know. I don't think I even met her. Mullins asks who the nun in the background of the photograph was, and though we know it to be Valak, the sister simply tells him that she doesn't remember. Having become obsessed with dark magic and Satanism, the Duke essentially built this monastery and attempted to summon Valak from the catacombs, only to be killed by the members of the Vatican, who sealed the rift with the blood of Christ. This effectively held evil at bay for hundreds of years, but as mentioned earlier, the bombing of the monastery during World War II released the entity onto the physical realm. Now freed, but contained within the walls of the monastery due to the continuous prayers of the nuns, Valak took on the form of a nun, simultaneously mocking their faith and blending in as he began to hunt the holy women down. She looks like us, but she's not one of us. It appears as a nun so it can hide among her cloister until it can corrupt us all. The entity had a number of powers that made him impossible to defeat, though he could be contained. These included, but weren't limited to, shape-shifting, using nightmarish visions and hallucinations to manipulate, frighten, and torment its victims, possession, supernatural strength, telekinesis, reality warping, and effectively immortality. With that said, he did still have weaknesses. These included holy relics, with Valak being vulnerable to sacred and consecrated items, the invocation of its name, which makes a demon weaker, strong faith in exorcism, which could loosen its grip on both people and its power in this world, to holy ground like the monastery, which was able to trap the demon for centuries. Your name gives me dominion over you, demon! You are Valak, the Defiler! At the local tavern, Franchi hears a tale of a child's death, believed to be linked to the evil permeating from the abbey. The concerned locals warn him that anyone who ventures near the cursed abbey may be marked for doom, but with his skepticism beginning to wane and the true extent of the horror becoming more apparent, instead of running, Frenchy becomes more involved. Is that place the abbey? Whatever evil is up there, it's leaking out, poisoning us. Still, Father Burke's repeated attempts to gain further access into the abbey are continually halted by the elusive Mother Superior. It doesn't help that sinister encounters also continue to torment him, making the experienced priest feel helpless. Irene's experiences with the Abbey also turn increasingly nightmarish, with her waking up from yet another horrific vision of Valak, only to find herself immediately under attack by the demon in its nun form. The terror reaches a climax as Father Burke rushes to Irene's aid, only to be subdued himself. Luckily, the pair are rescued by Frenchie, who, armed with a shotgun, intervenes just in time. In the chapel, Irene encounters several nuns and joins them in prayer, seeking solace and strength. However, a harrowing twist reveals that these nuns are mere illusions, manifestations of the demon's manipulations. The evil at the Abbey under the control of Valak is so pervasive now that the entity can manipulate reality, bending perceptions to its will. <laughs> As the story unravels further, the trio come upon a profound realization about Sister Victoria's death. She wasn't merely committing suicide, but was attempting to prevent Valak from using her as a vessel. With this, the team becomes determined to locate the sacred artifact containing Christ's blood, the very key to defeating the demon. The gateway is in the catacombs, but we can't close it without the relic, the blood of Christ. Christ? Jesus Christ? Sister Irene's faith continues to be tested, but her resolve remains unbroken, further reinforcing her as the film's spiritual anchor. Burke's scholarly background and previous traumatic experiences with exorcism equip him with a unique understanding of the events unfolding, even as he grapples with his past. While Frenchie's transformation from a skeptic to believer becomes more profound as he takes on a more active job in combating the evil, his role as the outsider and cynic provides contrast, though his encounters with the supernatural do begin to shift his perspective. As a result of these experiences, their dynamic evolves, marked by mutual trust, shared purpose, and a united front against a malevolent force. And now, with a clear understanding of the evil they're up against, Sister Irene, Father Burke, and Frenchie find themselves in the catacombs beneath the abbey. It's the setting as atmospheric as it's eerie, a labyrinth of shadows where they hope to find the key to their dilemma. Irene's earlier visions and dreams serve as a guiding light here, especially when she deciphers the clue, Mary points the way, leading them to the artifact they need. Mary points away. With the vial of Christ's blood in their possession, they begin their assault, with the catacombs becoming a battleground. Valak, showing its true demonic form, attacks the trio with a relentless fury, attempting to possess Irene and use her as a vessel to the outside world, while Father Burke is tormented by visions of Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. 
In a moment of sheer desperation, Irene smashes the vial, consuming the blood of Christ to prevent a demon from getting it, effectively turning the tables in their favor. Valak then attempts to strangle her, but Irene responds by spitting the holy blood onto the demon's face, sealing it away and temporarily ending its reign of terror once again. With dawn breaking, the sense of relief is palpable, but not everything is as it seems. As they leave the abbey, Irene inquires about Frenchie's real name, to which she reveals it's Maurice. But unbeknownst to her, the mark of an upside down cross is burned into the back of his neck, a grim indication that Valak has left a part of itself in him. The film then ties back to the larger Conjuring universe, showcasing Ed and Lorraine presenting footage from their exorcism of a possessed Maurice in the 70s, almost two decades after this event. I spoke some of the best Latin I'd ever heard. And like that, an upside down cross has started to appear from within his body. As a young novitiate on the cusp of her final vows, Sister Irene is plunged into a world that tests her faith and forces her to confront her own past and spiritual experiences. But her mysterious visions, although serving as a guiding light, often feel underexplored. They hint at a deeper connection to the supernatural events transpiring around her, but the full weight of this connection isn't wholly realized. Thaisa Famiga attempts to bring depth to Sister Irene, offering moments of vulnerability interspersed with determination, and her performance lends the character more gravitas than the script did. <laughs> Tasked with investigating the mysterious events at the Abbey, Father Burke carries the weight of past traumas. His previous exorcism gone wrong with the young boy Daniel serves as both a point of internal torment and a slightly trope-heavy device to introduce more supernatural encounters. With that said, Damien Bashir brings an authenticity to Father Burke, giving him a gravitas that's both fitting for an experienced priest and for someone haunted by past failures. His portrayal offers glimpses into Burke's inner struggle, making the character's journey more poignant. Daniel sustained severe injuries during the exorcism, once from which he could not recover. He died days later. I often wonder if I was too eager with my determination. Daniel, I'm sorry. Why would you help me? As the local villager who discovers the hanging nun and becomes entangled in the ensuing investigation, Frenchie offers lighter moments amidst the horror. Jonas Bloquet manages to infuse Frenchie with charm and wit. His role evolves, becoming more significant as the story progresses, but his backstory and true motivations remain slightly murky. Shouldn't we say a prayer? There's a time for prayer and a time for righteousness. It also still feels like a time for prayer as well, Father. As a central antagonist, Valak's presence looms throughout. The demon's history, while detailed in connection to the Abbey, lacks a deeper motivation or depth. The film doesn't want to explore his mythology, forcing us to piece the puzzle together on our own with external references and sources. Bonnie Aarons, with her unsettling and iconic look as a demon nun, is truly haunting. While the character might lack depth and motivation, Aarons ensures that every appearance of Valak on screen is genuinely chilling. The actors definitely try to breathe life and add complexity to their roles, but they're let down by a script that doesn't fully leverage their potential. A good horror film doesn't merely rely on atmospheric chills, but is anchored in strong, fleshed-out characters. And while The Nun boasted a talented cast, its characterization sometimes feels like it's stuck in the shadows. I'd like to take my vows, and I am ready to commit my life to him. Uh, that sister is a noble act. It's a shame, but... Corin Hardy takes a directorial reins for The Nun, and his love for horror is palpable. He orchestrates a blend of creeping dread with moments of heart-racing terror. The use of silence juxtaposed with sudden bursts of activity often keeps the viewers on their toes. Yet while Hardy manages to craft individual scenes of tension, the overall cohesion sometimes falters, particularly in moments that should seamlessly meld story with scares. I referenced Nightmare on Elm Street, and when Robert Englund was cast as Freddy, he really made that character instantly his own, and, and I felt the same after seeing The Conjuring 2 and, and seeing this nun character. Maxime Alexander's cinematography is, without a doubt, one of the film's standout elements. The Nun is visually rich, utilizing the bleak Gothic aesthetic of the Romanian setting to its fullest. The use of shadows, the interplay of light and dark, and the haunting visuals of the Abbey all contribute to the film's unsettling atmosphere. Wide shots of the sprawling, isolated landscape contrast sharply with tight, claustrophobic shots of the Abbey's cramped quarters, amplifying the sense of foreboding and confinement. 
The Nun movie is very classic gothic horror because from a Catholic standpoint, the idea of something that you hold really sacred could be perverted like that is what gives it the strength that it has. The Nun occupies a unique niche within the broader Conjuring universe, reaching back to the annals of history to weave its tale. The exploration of ancient relics, religious rites, and the age-old battles between good and evil set against the backdrop of a desolate abbey gives the film a distinct flavour. But while these elements do create an intriguing background, the film sometimes misses opportunities to delve deeper, leaving the audience wanting a more immersive experience in this dark corner of the Conjuring world. We're fascinated with horror because we know there's something of us inside. But some people can't control their own demons, and that's when tragedies happen. A vital component in any horror film, the sound design in The Nun is effectively unsettling. The whispering chants, the echoing footsteps, and the sudden silences all accentuate the eeriness. Abel Kozanievsky's score is hauntingly melodic, echoing the dichotomy of religious reverence and demonic terror. It's a symphony that often feels grander than the film itself. You could almost hear the screams of those tortured here so many centuries ago. When you walk through the hallways of this place, especially in the evening, you can feel it. There's a life force here, you know. Many people lived in this castle and died in the bowels of this castle. There's beauty to these locations. I think there's also an inherent creepiness just because of the history that's there. The things that must have occurred on these grounds, you know, they're ghosts of their own. The Nun showcases commendable strengths in cinematography and sound design, offering a visual and auditory feast. However, while the pieces are all there, they sometimes feel misaligned, resulting in a mosaic that's both hauntingly beautiful and occasionally fragmented. The dialogue often ranges from contemplative to the expository, feeling like it's explaining more than showing. This hampers the pacing, with the tension built by the atmosphere occasionally deflated by long-winded explanations or missed opportunities for character interactions. And while the film has its genuinely suspenseful moments, it could have benefited from a tighter, more focused narrative. The cast, especially Aaron's' Valak, will linger in the memories of viewers, but one can't help but wish for a more polished gem. It's been a long time since we've had somebody who can just stand in one place and evoke all sorts of tension and fear, just really unsettle you. What did you see? I saw none. This thing, it's come back for me. The sequel begins in the quaint town of Tarascon, France, 1956, where the young altar boy Jacques meanders into a church and is scolded by Father Noiret for being late. Entering the basement to retrieve wine for mass, the rebellious kid initially talks back at the priest before helping complete the ceremony. Cleaning up and staring at a portrait of a woman with no eyes, he returns the casket to the basement and is then haunted by an apparition. Running to the priest for comfort, he's horrified to see the holy water evaporate in front of them. And when the holy man warns the entity that it was in the house of God, in response, it forces him to become an unwilling aerialist, lifting him up and setting him alight. As Jacques flees, the menacing spirit of Valak makes its grand chilling entrance and leaves in the body of an unknown man. Meanwhile, in Italy, Irene is finding solace in the bond of her new coven, post her Valak escapade. However, the Conjuring universe doesn't seem done with her yet. The coven also houses the rebellious sister Deborah, who, always left of the rulebook, has taken to smoking and refusing to attend confession, believing that she had nothing to confess. When Irene sits down with her, hoping to give her guidance, she speaks of her mother, a troubled woman of faith whom her father had always likened her to. Deborah then opens up about her troubled upbringing in a hostile environment, and a father that was also willing to sacrifice his children for greater causes, sending Deborah to a nunnery while forcing his boys to enlist in the army. As the pair then joke about how they never thought they would end up here, we cut to that evening, where a senior nun recounts the tale of Valak and how he defiled and killed multiple nuns before being defeated. Interestingly, with Irene overhearing the conversation, it becomes apparent that the mother superior doesn't seem to know that it was her that contained him. In fact, she even speculates that the nun that confronted him went mad and was locked inside an asylum, indicating the church had effectively buried the truth. Something wrong with the school. Something doesn't feel right. Back over in France, we find Maurice navigating the boarding school maze as the caretaker of a local all-girls college. Taking a liking to one of its teachers, the sprightly Kate and her daughter Sophie, an outcast that is bullied by the other girls, Maurice has done his best to move on from the horrific experience of the previous film. 
Sophie, the school's underdog, often finds a knight in Maurice against her pint-sized tormentors, with the caretaker trying to teach them all to treat each other with respect. But spending their spare time releasing cockroaches in the office of their teachers, the bullies have a lot to learn about discipline. Overseeing the institution is the formidable Madame Laurent, who, through her stern exterior, conceals painful grief for her late son Cedric, an altar boy that was killed in bombings that destroyed part of the old chapel. There was a cockroach in my quarters again. Oh, that's unfortunate. It's an infestation. It's disgusting. I'll tend to it right away. Just when we'd forgotten about the sordid beginning with the demon, in a nearby town, a simple delivery job for a child turns nightmarish. Entering the home of an ex-run to drop supplies, the girl stumbles into a room with Maurice having some sort of supernatural fit. Unfortunately, after asking if he was okay, Valak appears and levitates the kid in a cold, vice-like grip before breaking her neck. Immediately alerted to this in a nocturnal soiree with the subconscious, Irene finds herself chasing a rather demonic-looking Maurice down a cryptic alley with his possessed aura pleading for her help. Almost as if on cue, upon waking, the imminent Cardinal Conroy and his ecclesiastical entourage beckon Irene, informing her about some disquieting news. Not only did Father Noiré perish, but so did many other of his holy colleagues, who died under suspicious and sacrilegious circumstances, with all signs pointing that it's moving west from Romania. To make matters worse, Father Burke, her main religious ally in the defeat of Valak in the previous film, is now dead from cholera. Despite her refusal to go, explaining that they didn't know what she went through, the Cardinal insists that the church needs her to perform another miracle. Sister Irene, you performed a miracle. The church needs another. As Irene travels to France via train, who should then enter her carriage but Deborah, who explains her mother was murdered in a fire, hence her frayed faith. But determined to help someone she looked up to, Deborah maintains that she will stay with Irene until her mission is complete. Back at the school, Sophie gets a seemingly genuine olive branch from her erstwhile tormentors who lure her to the school's secluded chapel. They then challenge her to lock eyes with a goat mosaic, which, when hit by sunlight, reveals a red glowing orb. The caveat, breaking the gaze, would supposedly summon the devil. In a predictable twist, the mean girls cage Sophie, who then gets an unsettling glimpse of Valak before being rescued by Maurice, who frees her and gives a stern reprimand to the mischievous lot that betrayed her. When Sophie cries, sensing that there was an evil presence on the grounds, Maurice lovingly tells her not to be afraid. He also hints at how fear had once caused him to do unimaginable things. While the implication here for the girl is that fear had challenged him to gain courage, there's a more sinister truth to his words yet to be uncovered. Meanwhile, Irene and Deborah arrive in Tarascon to extract intel from Jacques about the grisly incident with his priest. The boy explains what he experienced and then hands over a rosary he acquired from the dead body of the priest, but wanting no further part in the matter, he simply runs away. Undeterred, the two nuns gravitate towards the church where all signs pointed towards Valak's malevolent return. In fact, despite the nuns and a new priest holding mass, it's reported that nobody's been going, with many claiming that God had indeed forsaken them. Not only that, but Irene is further shocked to learn that the handyman of this church had recently arrived from Romania and was none other than Frenchie aka Maurice himself. Realizing he must be possessed, they make a start on trying to find him, as we cut back to the school, where a relationship is forming between Kate and the troubled Frenchman. Diving deeper into their enigma, a nun duo tread the historical cobbles of Avignon, where in the hallowed halls of the Grand Roi Palace de Pape, they converse with a librarian with a chilling revelation. Valak essentially desires the artifact known as the Eyes, relics once owned by the indomitable Saint Lucy, the patron saint of the blind who was burned alive by pagans and remained defiant till the end. In the best set piece of the entire film, Irene stumbles upon a mystical newsstand with its printed pages of media slowly rustling and flipping to conjure a haunting visage of Valak. She also sees glimpses of the tragic demise of St. Lucy all those years ago before being rescued by Deborah. Back at the academic fortress, Sophie actually lays eyes on the caretaker, temporarily staring into space as if possessed. Concurrently, after also finding Maurice in a catatonic state outside the chapel a few hours later, and then hearing the sound of her son calling from inside, Madame Laurent enters and is greeted by a mirage of her lost Cedric, moments before Valak the puppeteer ensnares and dispatches her. As Irene and Deborah discuss the rosary bead of the priest and learn that it carried a unique family crest, they begin to speculate that Valak might actually have been a fallen angel. Stripped of its heavenly power due to decisions it made that went against God, it gathered its might in hell while always seeking for a way to reclaim that which was taken from it. 
Although in the hand of the demon, the eyes of Lucy would wreak destruction on the world, in more benevolent hands, it could be used to effectively send Valak to hell once and for all. With that, they realize that every religious victim of Valak is in fact actually a descendant of Lucy, hunted for information on where their ancestors' heavenly eyes were buried. These victims must be protecting a secret. In the hands of a demon, it would be unthinkable. And as they begin wondering where the eyes could be, they're informed that there was a monk named Jean Paul, who, according to his letters to the Vatican, had buried it inside a winery turned boarding school, hence why Maurice was now there. Warned the demon will take any form to deceive them, Irene and Deborah make their way to the school as Maurice, Kate, and Sophie prepare dinner and what is presumably his first date with the girl's mother. Almost sensing their arrival, Valak, not one for subtleties, channels its wrath by trying to possess Frenchie. Just as Kate notices the upside down cross on his neck, it then sends a demonic goat with a proclivity for theatrics after the girls, forcing Maurice to lead them to safety. Much to their shock, when the two nuns arrive, they scream at him to get away from Kate and Sophie, explaining that Valak was inside of him. In response, the entity fully corrupts Frenchie. Instead of attacking them, he simply rushes to the chapel, causing the two nuns to desperately try and stop him through prayer, before ultimately knocking him out. Navigating the chapel corridors, Irene and Deborah are led by the mother and daughter to the goat mosaic the bullies had used to terrify Sophie. Using a well-placed light behind it that guides them to the correct spot, they unearth the eyes. But as they do, Sophie notices the goat had disappeared, indicating Valak's minion was on the prowl. Finding her faith in courage, Deborah rushes to aid the girls, who were menacingly hunted by it. Making things worse is Maurice, who, upon gaining consciousness, knocks Kate out and begins to choke Irene to death. Effectively saving her life, Sophie distracts him by running away with the container, as a demon goat in a dramatic flare assumes the likeness of the freshly deceased Madame Laurent, ensuring that no student heart rate remains steady. It then takes it a step further by impaling one of the bullies in the shoulder with its horns, before, in a stroke of either architectural irony or perhaps an act of divine intervention, the school's bell tower crumbles down, ensuring that Sophie was saved from Maurice. Wielding the eyes as a spiritual defibrillator, Irene and Deborah attempt an exorcism, but donning Maurice like a mask, Valak lunges for the container and sets its eyes on Irene with a smile. For a fleeting moment, it seems the end is nigh, yet as Valak attempts a fiery send-off for Irene, as he did with the priest, she's flooded with visions of her mother, whose divine prowess was mistaken for madness, effectively sending her to the mental asylum. Irene then realizes she's not just any nun, she's actually a descendant of Saint Lucy, which is why both she and her mother had suffered from supernatural vision. And so, drawing on the land's vinous history before its educational makeover, when all seems like it was lost, Irene and Deborah channel its latent power. As wine caskets rupture, showering the levitating Valak in a deluge, their devout incantations morph the Merlot into the sanctified blood of Christ. Igniting in a blazing spectacle, the infernal beast is defeated, and the once diabolical goat retreats to its ornate stained glass prison, and amidst this fiery tableau, Maurice belts out a spine-chilling scream. Luckily, our resilient nuns are able to restore him through prayer, and reduce the malevolent antagonist to smouldering ashes. As Dawn paints the canvas on the next scene, Irene discovers a rejuvenated Maurice in the garden, engrossed in the tender nurturing of his tomato plant, an evocative symbol sprouting from the seeds gifted by the young nun during their Romanian party. Joining him are Kate and Sophie, but we're left wondering the cinematic paradox of Maurice. The film hints at his freedom, however, it begs the question, if all's well in the kingdom of Maurice, why do our beloved Ghostbusters Ed and Lorraine Warren whip out their exorcism toolkit later on to help him? I spoke some of the best Latin I'd ever heard. And like that, an upside down cross started to appear from within his body. We've created this universe that has such a huge fan base. The demon nun really captured the zeitgeist. It would be great to uh, eventually bring it back full circle, bring the nun story and tie it back into the conjuring. Irene's ancestral revelations unveil not just her connection to Saint Lucy, but also an ephemeral glimpse of Vera Farmiga's Lorraine Warren. It's more than just a spiritual connection. The film flirts with the suggestion that perhaps Lorraine and sister Irene share some DNA. With this, Valak's dogged pursuit of St. Lucy's descendants would take on a whole new shade of malevolence, but I just wish they did a better job of connecting all the dots. Thaisa Famiga, with her magnetic screen presence, offers a deeply sincere portrayal of Sister Irene, delicate yet resolute, with a welcome wit and an almost ecumenical outlook. 
when we first meet Irene in this movie, she has a much stronger aura of confidence around her. You know, she's still just as kind and sweet as she was in the first movie, but she's lost her naivety. Supporting Thais as Irene is the more circumspect sister Deborah, played by Storm Reed, whose initial quest for a divine spectacle soon morphs into a much more perilous undertaking. We understand why she was initially hesitant to commit to the church, and see her gain her faith through efforts to support her good friend and mentor. Jonas Bloquet does a decent enough job as a troubled caretaker, whose good nature and spirit are corrupted by a malevolent force. He's a very sympathetic character that espouses good virtues to the kids under his charge, and simply wants to find peace, something Valak won't allow. It's all the more tragic when we realise that Frenchie is still plagued by darkness after this chapter. Caitlin Rose Downey is great as the outcast student, bullied for being the daughter of a teacher, yet having the resolve to deal with it in silence and keep it from her mother. And while Anna Popplewell is okay as her mother, she's severely underutilised by the script, we don't really learn much about Kate, and all of her scenes feature her shuffling out to meet either Maurice or her daughter in the same hallway until the climax. Michael Shavs is a, a wonderful, wonderful director. He, um, he was very open to wanting to make the best project possible, and it's the collaboration, which is something I really respond to. As scary as these movies are, they also have such an incredible fan base. And, um, it's just amazing how they've real, this, this series has really reached into the culture and just, uh, I think great horror movies, great movies have a great relationship with the audience. The Conjuring series is celebrated for its unique paranormal investigative narrative, predominantly focusing on the Warrens. Each installment presents them with a fresh demonic conundrum to decipher, yet the quandary with Valak, the sinister nun, lies in trying to give the entity more significance without giving him a voice to say what his motivations were. The backstory of Valak, once an angel ostracized by the divine, remains an enigmatic facet of the tale. Hell's hierarchy, it appears, offers limited privileges. Valak's obsession with a sacrosanct artifact, whose purpose remains nebulous, seems predominantly to incite terror in dimly lit corridors and age-old repositories. Wait, I, I don't understand. I, please, I... The demon is a presence, but not a character. For a fallen angel seeking heavenly power, it would have been great to have a scene where it actually spoke to Irene, perhaps to show contempt towards humanity. After all, it made one mistake out of fear and was banished, while God favoured humans, allowing them the opportunity to make multiple mistakes but still be granted forgiveness. That's a very juicy motivation I made up on the spot, but the writers who had ample time to work on this make it seem as though Valak just wants to scare people for fun and be powerful. Valak is moving across Europe, killing these people. It's also filled with demonic forms that we haven't seen before. It's okay to be scared. Directed by Michael Chavez, a man no stranger to the Conjuring universe, and penned by Goldberg, Nang, and Cooper, who brought us the insane films Malignant and Megan, the sequel has them curiously kill Father Burke off screen and sideline the characters of Irene and Deborah. And while Famiga's character grapples with their past and its revelations, it predominantly serves as a narrative device. Instead of Irene, the story tilts more towards Maurice and his relationship with Kate and Sophie. As Frenchie becomes Valak's vessel, the emotional stakes are raised, with Irene trying not only to stop the demon from gaining unimaginable power, but also trying to save a good friend that stopped at nothing to save her in the past. Yet the narrative feels cyclical, with Valak's spectral outbursts and confrontations with Irene following a repetitive blueprint. Notable moments such as Irene's chilling encounter with a newsstand transforming into the menacing silhouette of Valak punctuate the slow grind, but they're few and far between. I'm sorry, Lorraine. <laughs> Valak was horrifying in The Conjuring, but the frequent and overt display of him throughout The Nun diminishes the impact. The pattern becomes all too predictable. An unsuspecting individual ventures into an antiquated setting, only to be confronted by a cacophony of disturbances, culminating in the malevolent visage of the demonic nun. Not to mention the repetitive nature of having Irene defeat him using the blood of Christ once again, before ending with Frenchie still being possessed. There's undeniable atmospheric tension and sporadic jolts of horror, but a deeper thematic resonance and narrative cohesion remains elusive amid the encompassing shadows. And ultimately, despite Valak's evil intent, the demon exhibits a conspicuous lack of finesse, granting Irene ample opportunities to defeat him, something he didn't offer to the other descendants of Lucy, who were swiftly dispatched in the opening. The plot's loose threads leave fans in an agonizing cliffhanger limbo. The possession puzzle of Frenchie, which cascades to Lorraine in The Conjuring, remains unsolved in what can only be called narrative desecration. 
We'll take Maurice here. He's a French Canadian farmer, had nothing more than a third grade education, yet after he was possessed, he spoke some of the best Latin I'd ever heard. Which brings me to the three stages of demonic activity infestation, oppression, possession. Whatever Lorraine sees, feels, takes a toll on her. A couple months ago, we were working on a case. She saw something. It took a real big piece. So what happened to Maurice? Well, he tried to kill his wife, but instead he shot her in the arm and then he turned the gun on himself. Maurice had a very troubled life with little to live for. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we finally do a deep dive of the entire Nun timeline. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and check out the Film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. What we're going after. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. What did she do? She's standing.